So mark your own, here we go. What kind of written questions will you see? Well, a circular loop of wire has a diameter of 0.1 meters. If it is removed from a 0.5 Tesla magnetic field in 0.1 seconds, what's the average induced EMF? So it's asking for EMF. We have two equations for voltage. We have this one. Don't write this down. And we have this one. I use this one when it's a magnetic bar or a, a, a conducting bar being moved through. Although with a, we, we actually ended up deriving this second one kind of from that by being clever. I use the second one, Faraday's law, when there's a coil. Although again, you can use this with a little bit of cleverness. Oh, the bar means there's one wire, the change in flux over time. There is an actual velocity built into there because it's over time. You, you, you can, but we're going to use the two different ones. So negative n change in flux over change in time. I'm going to list my data here. It says a ah, circular loop of wires, so n is 1. Changing flux, well change in flux is change in anything. Uh, sorry, change in anything is final minus initial. Good gosh, where was that? Change in anything is final minus initial. I think my final is 0 because it says it's removed from. My initial is going to be uh, magnetic field times area. So I think my change in flux is actually going to be negative B.5 times A. It's a circular loop of wire, so the area is pi times R squared. You guys noticed that it was a diameter that I gave you sneakily in the question as opposed to a radius. If you didn't notice that, you'll get 1.5 instead of 2 out of 2. I know that was a little bit cheap. So here's what I have. Negative 1. Mabot is grumpy with himself. He just caught that now. Pi r squared over time. Let's see how that works, I hope. Negative point, no, negative uh, point 0.5 times pi times 0 0.05 squared divided by 0.1. You get uh, negative 0 0.39, point, sorry, point 0 0.039. I'm okay still? Now you want me to go, you got me going to check my answer key. Did I catch you too? Really? Pretty sure I got, uh, yeah, 0.39. Uh, I dropped the negative. Oh, because there was a negative already in there, Mr. Duke. And I think I forgot to include it in my calculator, did I? Oh, because my change in flux was actually negative, and I forgot to include the negative there. Let's go back to my answer key, Mr. Duke, right here. Uh, this is negative, so this should have been a negative right there. Anyways, you get 0 0.039 volts. Uh, one mark for the equation, one mark for the answer. If you used a point 0.1, then you get 1.5. Number two, a wire, okay, now they want an induced EMF for a wire. Now I'm going to use BLV. This is straight plug and chug. It's going to be 0.4. Uh, the wire is 0.5 meters long. The speed is 20. 0.4 times 0.5 times 20. Oh. 4.0 volts. Double check my answer key. Yay. Uh, if the wire is part of a circuit with resistance 6 ohms, what's the current? Okay, well, current is voltage divided by resistance, or it's EMF divided by resistance, because EMF is an archaic form term for voltage. Uh, so it's going to be 4 divided by 6. I can do that in my head. That's 2 thirds. Is it uh, 0 0.67? amps or 0.667 amps. One mark. Number three, back EMF. It wants the back EMF and I noticed that it's talking about stationary and turning. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this into stationary and turning. Uh, I'm going to use uh, V back 
equals EMF minus I times internal resistance. And I know that when it's stationary, the back voltage is zero. 12 minus, oh good gosh, I don't need to walk through any of this. Mabod, you're laughing at me because I don't need to walk through any of this. Is that what you're saying? They gave me the current. They gave, oh, it's a straight plug and chug, is it? Let me go check, Mr. Duick. Ah, yeah, 11 volts. Is that right? That was dumb of me. Read the question, Mr. Duick. Turn the page. Transformers, I'll just go through the answers. This is straight cross multiplying. So uh, they want the secondary voltage. I want primary voltage over secondary equals primary number of coils over secondary, or you could have secondary on top in both of them. The one that isn't matching is current. Current is reciprocally related to the voltages and the number of coils. Anyway, uh, 3.6 times 10 to the three volts. It does say it's a step up transformer. So my secondary voltage should be bigger. Hey, it is. And if the secondary current is 3 amps, what's the primary current? 90 amps. Step up transformer gives you higher voltage, lower current. And is that th that's it. That's the quiz. By the way, if you haven't picked up on number three, I'm pretty sure the written question that you're going to see on your test is going to have a before and after where you're going to, I'm not going to give you the internal resistance of the coil. And in fact, I've just decided I'm going to change this question for next year on my quiz to reflect that. Give yourself a score out of nine. Is your test next class? Yeah? You know what? I'm not even going to bother collecting these marks. You can hang on to the quiz. That was for your own personal edification. You don't even need to turn in a piece of paper with your score on it. We're towards the end of the year. How much have I collected over the year? Lots. Last day, we looked at equilibrium. Well, we tried to. Oh, your homework also I gave you was uh, from the electromagnetic induction review. Uh, I guess, were there any questions that you couldn't get after you looked at my answer key? I'll send out, I'll be doing a tutorial today after school, I'll send that out, and uh, I'm probably going to put up a web page showing you all of my tutorials for the year. Oh, wait a minute, I think I already have that. Let's pause the video for a second. Last day, we started equilibrium, and we said that translational equilibrium was when the sum of all the forces was zero. And I said, Chelsea, there's going to be two ways to think about it. If you have a diagram where all of your forces are nice and vertical and horizontal, you can say everything up equals everything down, everything left equals everything right, zip zap, and you're good to go. If you have a diagram where there are things at angles, what we can say is we can, I'll give you three forces. Sydney will add them together, tip to tail, tip to tail, tip to tail. But to show that the net force is zero, we'll draw a triangle that ends up back where? What does our vector triangle look like? It's a triangle that ends up back where it started from. That's zero displacement or forces. I gave you a few questions to try. I think I gave you, oh no, I gave you questions from the review. Were there any of those that you were having trouble with that you wanted me to go over? Answers were attached, and I'm trying desperately to remember if I put my answer key online or not. If I didn't, I'll put it up in a few minutes. Hearing none, seeing none, let's move on to lesson two, torque. This is new. Torque. Rotational equilibrium. Lesson two. Yeah. This is for you. Okay. Translational equilibrium, that's the fancy word tie for when all of the forces add up to zero. Translational equilibrium. Those of you that did math 12 this year, you learned about horizontal and vertical translation slides. Well, it's also a physics term. We're saying, hey, it ain't moving. Uh, symbolically, we said translational equilibrium was the sum of all the forces is zero. We need to define torque. Torque is the strength of rotation that an object possesses. And it turns out the strength of rotation depends on two factors. Meter stick demonstration number one I wrote here. So torque depends on 
two factors. First one it depends on is distance from the pivot point, the point of rotation. The second thing it depends on is the perpendicular force applied. And I have to be fussy. The force does have to be perpendicular. If I had applied a force along the meter stick, it's not going to rotate at all. You're not going to it. I mean, I can push really, really hard this way. I'm sorry. You could resist me very, very easily then. It's a perpendicular force to the distance. What if they're not perpendicular components? Next lesson. So torque is defined as the perpendicular force multiplied by the distance the force is from a pivot point or fulcrum point. It's a vector. It's a multiplication question. And Megan, it's technically a cross product vector. But we're not going to deal with that. Those that do it next year, you'll do it properly. Uh, we're just going to say, as an equation, the symbol for torque, well, we'd like to use a T, but T is taken. What's a lowercase t stand for in physics time? What did an uppercase t stand for? Uh, well, units, but what did it, as a variable, what was it? It showed up in circular motion. Period. OK. So we use a Greek letter tau. That's where our letter T came from. It's a curly little T. Symbol for torque is that. And it's equal to force perpendicular times distance. Perpendicular force times distance. By the way, if you're in first year physics, that would be wrong, because multiplying with a dot is a completely different vector multiplication operation than what's called a cross product. We're doing a cross product. But I'll be honest, I'm just going to write. I'm not going to be all fussy all year. Pardon me? Because there's two ways to multiply vectors. One way, one way, if you use a dot product, you get a scalar answer. And that's what we're doing, say, when we go uh, work equals force times distance. That's a dot product. Uh, one way, you get a vector answer. That's what you're doing here. It's a cross product. The units, well, what do I measure force in? What do I measure distance in? It is Newton meters. Now, I want you to notice this is the same units as work. No, it's not. It's a vector. This, this is why there's a difference, by the way, because work was force times distance as well. This is not work. This is not energy. Energy was a scalar. That's a dot product. It's a cross product. It is Newton meters. We haven't made up a new unit for that. There might be one. I have to go double check that. But now, our trick of unit analysis, Jaron, won't quite work. We'll have to look at the actual situation and say, hey, is this torque or work? Direction. Well, we're talking about rotation. So we're going to talk about clockwise, CW, or counterclockwise. How do you think we'll abbreviate that? CCW. How much torque would the following force exert on the beam? Double check. Is the force perpendicular to the beam? OK. Torque is going to be force perpendicular times distance. See, I already dropped the little cross thing. It's going to be 12.3, careful, not times 89, times what? 0.89. And I get 10.9 Newton meters. How can I increase the torque, apply a bigger force, or what else can I make bigger? The distance, those of you that work in mechanics, this is why wrenches work. And the longer wrench, you don't have to push as hard. You don't have to turn as hard. You don't have to apply as big a force. Why? You've just increased your torque by increasing the distance. 
the old trick that we used to do on construction. If we had a really, really stubborn bolt and a short wrench, you would slip a pipe over the handle of the wrench, and now you've suddenly made your, to your distance a meter. Wow, great stuff. Example two. How much torque would the following force exert on the beam? Is it perpendicular? It can be. What I would do then is I would break this up into F perpendicular and F parallel. Hey, that's sort of like we did way back in forces on ramps. Yes, this is also nice convenient review. Also, can you see the Z? So it turns out, because since they gave me a 65 degree angle, I would have no problem, let me zoom in here a little bit, I would have no problem if you just said, hey, Mr. Duick, this angle here is uh, 35, or 35, 25, and, and I'm okay with, I always like to try and find the angle that they gave me and put it in my diagram, it's just me being a nerd. So that's 25, but it turns out that uh, this angle here is 65. Which trig function, uh, parallel, sorry, perpendicular, opposite, adjacent, or hypotenuse? Here's my angle. This side here, opposite, adjacent, or hypotenuse? Opposite. And the force that they gave me is the hypotenuse, yes? Which trig function? Sine, good review as well. Pardon me? Oh, is it, uh, this time isn't two lines sine. This time is, because two lines sign on the ramp was that was always sign right sadly that breaks down it was good for forces on ramps uh it's going to be sign of perpendicular sorry sign of per good gosh do it it's a monday no kidding sign of 65 equals perpendicular over 2.8 so i guess f perpendicular equals 2.8 sine 65 if you wanted the torque it's going to be 2.8 sine 65 times 0.43 the distance in fact what you'll often see next year is you'll see this torque equals f D sine theta. I, I generally don't memorize that because there are a few strange, really bizarre diagrams where they give you a different angle and it ends up being the cos. Or if you had just filled in that angle, it would have been the cosine. We chose not to. So I generally don't go that way. What would you get, Ty? 1.09 .09 Newton meters. Anybody else? So there's our definition of torque, and that leads us then to rotational equilibrium. When an object is not rotating, it is said to be in rotational equilibrium. It's not spinning. In other words, the sum of all the torques is zero. Uh, I prefer to use actually this. The sum of all the torques clockwise equals the sum of all the torques counterclockwise. And then what I started doing my second year of teaching physics 12, which really helped my students with these diagrams, is I also drew a little arrow. That's clockwise. That's counterclockwise. I draw those little arrows above it, kind of like Vector saying, you know what? Anything that's rotating in that direction goes on the left-hand side. Anything that's rotating in the other direction is going to go on the uh, right-hand side. That got rid of most of our mistakes. This is my, hey, is there a beam? Are they talking about torque? I start here the same way. Hey, is there a collision? The sum of all momentum equals zero. Hey, is there a force? Free body diagram. Hey, is there, I've tried to give you standard approach. Oh, are we in orbit? FC equals FG. I've tried to give you some standard approaches. If I see a beam, it's pretty obvious from the picture, and they're talking about rotation, I start here. Why is this so nice? Ah, turn the page. 
First of all, we need to talk about center of gravity or center of mass. Take a standard meter stick. It is true that there is mass here and here. However, mathematically, I can represent the center of mass at a point. And I can even find it for you. If I take any meter stick and I rest it on my fingers and I move my fingers together, they'll touch right at the center of mass. And you can try this. Move, I'll, I'll try and stop at a different point. So I'm going to hold my left hand on your right still. I can't. Right? Here, try, Brian. Pause the video. So every molecule of wood in the meter stick and figure has, a, has mass and therefore experiences a force due to gravity. The figure shows a few sample vectors. So the center of gravity of a, come on. He does this every so often. There we go. Center of gravity of a ball would be dead center. Center of gravity of a car, probably a little bit lower because more metal is contained in the bottom. A car is not nice and symmetrical. Center of mass of a baseball bat would be probably right about there. Even though there's more length going this way, it's thinner, less mass. Uh, a center of mass doesn't even have to be part of the object itself. The center of mass for a glass is hanging in midair in the center of the glass. So the center of gravity or the center of mass can be outside the solid part of the object. So center of mass of an object is the point where the mass of an object might be considered to be concentrated for the purposes of easy calculation. For most situations this year, the center of mass will be placed at the center of gravity. An exception would be near a black hole or near a big planet where the gravitational field is non-uniform. And I, okay, the nerd moment, so technically I can't say always. If you're ever near a black hole, most of the physics that I'm teaching you won't work all that well, so just remember that if it ever happens to you, okay? Uh, where would you expect the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system to be located? Earth, Moon, are they identical masses? No. You know what? The center of mass is probably right about there, closer to the Earth, because that's where most of the mass is concentrated. I wrote here meter stick demonstration number two. We already did that. So. If we have both translational equilibrium and rotational equilibrium, we have the two conditions that are required for static equilibrium. If an object is in static equilibrium, it ain't moving, it ain't spinning. The sum of all the forces is zero. The sum of all the torques is zero. And in general, if there is a beam, we use torques. Cables use forces. Example three. What force would be needed to balance the beam in figure 1.31? So I've got a pivot right in the middle. I'm applying a mystery force at 175 centimeters from the very, very, very left. How big does it need to be so that this teeter-totter would be in balance? And yes, we're doing the physics of seesaws, teeter-totters from when you were a kid. And you may have learned some of this on your own. If you were on a teeter-totter with a friend of yours and your masses were not the same, you may have learned that you could slide yourself a little bit forward or lean back or you, you could adjust it. What you were really doing is moving the center of mass closer or further to the pivot point, which was dead center on the teeter-totter. Is there a beam? Say yes. Is it in equilibrium? Say yes. Then I'm going to say this. The sum of all the torques clockwise in that direction equals the sum of all the torques counterclockwise in that direction. The next thing I always need to make sure of is I know where the pivot point is. The pivot point is right here. I always like to color it in to remind myself that's where I'm measuring my distances from. Not from the zero on the left-hand side, but how far I am from there. And I go label my diagram. This is going to spin it that way. Oh, there's also a center of mass right there. And there's a force right there. 
uh, sorry, not M, Mr. Duick. Which way are all three of those forces acting? Could this possibly be an equilibrium then? But it says it is. There has to be a force up. And the only place that there can be a force up, and I'll call it F pivot. Mr. Duick, that's a problem. Why, Diana? Because now there's two forces you don't know, Mr. Duick. You don't know mystery force F, and you don't know the pivot force. That's why this is a job for torque. Ready? Let's move along this beam. And first of all, on the left-hand side, let's write down any torques that will cause it to spin clockwise, 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 clockwise. You know what? I think this. Force times how far is it from the pivot? Don't say 175. Don't say 1.75. How far is it from? Jared? 75 is also incorrect. 0.75. What would cause this to spin counterclockwise? That 8 newtons times its distance from the pivot. Hey, what about the other two forces in the middle? This is why torque is so nice. How far are they from the pivot? Zero. So what's their torque if torque is force times distance from the pivot and the distance from the pivot is zero? How big a torque do they exert? So even though I don't know both those forces, who cares? And that's going to be why torque is nice, Diana. In fact, you're going to find over the next couple of questions, we can put the pivot point mathematically wherever we want it to be and just adjust our distances accordingly. Oh, if I have two forces that I don't know, I'll put the pivot at one of them because it won't exert a torque anymore mathematically. Uh, how would I get the F by itself? Five point three three Newtons. Turn the page. How far from the pivot must the 64 Newton object be placed to balance the beam? So we're going to label our free body diagram on the beam. What are the forces acting on this beam? Get the obvious one. Where am I going to put gravity? OK, so I'm definitely going to have mg down. Mr. Duick, they didn't tell me the mass. I can't figure that force out. I'll put the pivot right there, and then it won't exert a torque. I'll solve this with torques. What else? Well, I have the 64 newtons down. I have the 56 newtons down. This can't possibly be all. Otherwise, this whole system would have to be crashing down, is it? Nope. The pivot point is exerting a huge force up. I'll call it F up or F pivot. I don't know it. I don't care. How far is it from the pivot? Zero. How much torque will it exert? None. And that's why I'm going to solve this with torques. There is a beam. I'm going to say the sum of all the torques clockwise in this direction equals the sum of all the torques counterclockwise in that direction. Clockwise means it's going to spin in this direction. Which force or forces will cause it to spin this way? 64, we're doing torque, so it's going to be force times distance. It's going to be 64 times, how far is it from the pivot? So how far is that? X. Any other clockwise torques? No, nope. then put an equal sign. What would cause this to rotate counterclockwise? This is why I find the arrows really help me, by the way. The 56, that's a torque, times its distance from the pivot. How far? 0.42. What about these two? Don't care. Yep. Um, did, did people in the States learn physics 
symmetric, or do they run it with like e? Uh, most of them. Uh, most of the time in university, it would be metric. I think in high school, a little both. Yeah. They flip flop. They do both. Thank you. You're back now, by the way. Yeah. Squirrel. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> By the way, what's torque measured in in Imperial? You're in shop. What do your torque wrenches measure in? I guarantee it's not Newton meters. What are the units on your torque wrench? <laughs> Foot pounds. Foot pounds. Foot, distance, pounds, force. It's also a force times distance. <laughs> Uh, 0.368. Where this really shines is in something like example 5. 0.368. Okay. Says the force of gravity on the bridge is 9.6 times 10 to the fifth newtons. Okay, I see that. What upward force must be exerted at end P and end Q to support the bridge and the truck? If the force of gravity on the truck is 4.8 times 10 to the fourth, what are the forces acting on this beam? Get the obvious ones. Gravity, I, they already drew it. I'll lengthen it just to make it obvious. Right there, there is the force. You know what? I'll call it. M beam G, because I got more than one mass in this question. M B G. What else? Well, I got this truck here. I got mass of the truck times G. This can't possibly be it. If those were the only two forces, this bridge would have to be crashing down. Is it? So there must be at least one upwards force. Where? Oh, so you're saying there's an upwards force at P and an upwards force at Q? I agree. Okay. How many forces don't I know? Two, if I try solving this by saying everything up equals everything down, I'm out of luck. What we're going to do is we're going to use torques, and we're going to put the pivot wherever we want to. We're going to put the pivot mathematically right at one of the forces that I don't know. Jake, where do you want to put the pivot? At force P or force Q? Pick. Q. Okay, so all of us right now, let's draw a little pivot right there. That's where all of our distances are going to be referenced from for the rest of this question. No, it doesn't matter. This, there was no wrong answer. That's why I asked you. I knew you'd have to get it right. <laughs> Is this a beam? Yes. Is it in static equilibrium? Yes. Then I can say the sum of all the torques clockwise equals the sum of all the torques Counterclockwise. Clockwise. So now imagine if it could spin on a hinge right there. You have to use your imagination. Which force or forces would cause it to spin clockwise this way? FP? Now we're going to do torque. So it's going to be force P times its distance from the pivot. How far is it from the pivot where Jake put it? John? 17. Are there any other forces that would cause it to spin clockwise? You're saying that would cause it, if that was the hinge, to spin this way? I don't think, you gotta use your imagination, right? Imagine it's free to rotate right there. That's it. Equals. What force or forces would cause this to spin counterclockwise? This way. I think there's two. 
this one and this one. It's going to be mass of the beam times g times how far is it from the pivot? How did you get the 8.5? Uh, the whole distance across is 17, right there. They said that's 8.5, so if I minus, and it happens to be halfway. You know what? It's the center of mass. The beam is 18 long, sorry, 17 long. Center of mass is going to be at 8.5. By the way, I'm running out of room, so this is going to annoy some of you. There. Plus, there's another torque, the truck. Mass of the truck times g times how far is it from the pivot. Okay. What are we trying to find? FP? How would I get the FP by itself? Divide by 17. So going to be this. The force from pillar P is going to be, now, mass of the beam times G, they gave that to me because they gave this in newtons. That is mg. So it's just going to be 9.6 times 10 to the fifth times 8.5. There is mg times distance plus mass of the truck times G, they gave that to me as well in newtons. 4.8 times 10 to the fourth times its distance. And you guys said divide that by 17. Brackets around the top, of course. Nine point six times eight point five plus four point eight times 5, close bracket, divided by 17. You get 494116, so 4.94 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's one force. I need to find the other one. I could repeat this whole procedure, Jake, if I wanted to. I could now say, put the pivot there at location P. Readjust your clockwises and counterclockwises because your directions will have changed. Alicia, adjust your distances. And that would work. Or, you know what? I could also go like this. Everything up has to equal everything down. What are the forces up? What are the forces down? Do I know this? Yep. Do I know this? Yep. I want to find this. Do I know this? Well, I didn't, but I just figured it out. So now I've used torques. I've reduced my unknowns to one force. Now I can use equilibrium and say, you know what? F up equals F down. F left equals F right. They got to they gotta, gotta match. So FQ is going to be 9.6 times 10 to the fifth plus 4.8 times 10 to the fourth. Take away 4.94 times 10 to the fifth. And I'm going to use the value that's still on my calculator. So 9.6 times 10 to the fifth plus 4.8 times 10 to the fourth minus that guy. And it looks like FQ is 5.14 times 10 to the fifth newtons. 
Which support is having to do more work, right? having to exert a bigger force right now, Q or P? Why? Truck's closer to it. As the truck slowly moves sideways, eventually P is going to have to be exerting a bigger force than Q. And I could calculate it anywhere you wanted me to. Just give me the distances, tell me how far the truck is along the bridge, and I can figure out the moment of inertia and the force. Diving board, example six. How many of you have stood on a diving board before? Okay. So, a diving board has a length of 6.5 meters and a mass of 52 kilograms. A diver of mass 65 kilograms stands on one end of the board. Find the force exerted at location A and location B in order to maintain equilibrium. All right. Let's label the forces acting on this board, get the obvious ones. And gravity is going to be at the center of mass of the board. So the whole board is, don't write this down, that long, center of mass, there's going to be mass of the board times G. I'm eyeballing it, but I'm telling you, it's, it's about there. Yes? What else? What else? Mass of the diver times G. Which direction are the two forces acting right now? Down, do diving boards go crashing into the earth? So there has to be some forces up. Okay, and this is where we gotta get clever. So people want to say FA and FB now. Put your pencils down, look up. Let's suppose that FA, don't write this down, don't write this down. Let's suppose FA was pushing up and FB was pushing up. If I put my pivot right there temporarily, this torque here, if that's the pivot, clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. How about here? How about here? Ty. That, this can't possibly be pointing up, otherwise it would have to be spinning. Turns out, pick your pencils up, FA is down. And you may have noticed on the end of the diving board, there's actually a couple of rivets right there holding it down. That it, it's a, it is applying a force down right there. See how we reasoned our way to that? Now, I have three forces all acting down. I better have at least one force acting up, and that turns out FB is canceling out all three of those other ones. That's the physics of a diving board. Okay. What do you want to find first, FA or FB? I don't care. FA? Okay, this is a beam. The other force that I don't know is FB. So, Dorothy, we're going to put our pivot point. Actually, let's not color over the letter B because that's going to be confusing. We're going to put our pivot point right there. Pivot, I just draw a triangle to kind of say that's where I'm going to imagine it teeter-tottering on. That's going to define clockwise and counterclockwise. Is this a beam? Yeah, well, the sum of all the torques clockwise equals the sum of all the torques counterclockwise in that direction. You know, I think the other thing that I should do is I should add some lengths to my diagram to make it easier. They did say that this here was 6.5 meters in the question, yes? I think that's going to help. All right. Clockwise. Clockwise. From here, clockwise. What force or forces, what torques would cause this to rotate clockwise? 
these two, don't forget to multiply by their distance from the pivot. We'll have to do a little bit of arithmetic, I think, here. So it's going to be mass of the beam times g times, how far is it from the pivot? Well, it's at the center of mass, so how far is this distance? 3.25? How far then is this distance? Also, 3.25. How far is that distance then? 3.25 take away what? 1.8, which is what? 1.45. By the way, for the torque unit, big diagrams are helpful. If you're doing a free body diagram, don't do the beam small. I almost always draw my beams so that they're almost always the width of the whole page. Just a little trick of the trade. What, what do we say? Uh, 1.45 plus mass of the diver times G times how far is he from the pivot? Do you see it? Not 3.25, but what? 4.7? Yeah, whatever, whatever 3.25 plus 4.7? So you're going to find in these, you have to do a little bit of arithmetic to find the distances quite often. Those are my clockwise torques. What's causing this to spin anti-clockwise, counterclockwise? Only one torque. Force A times his distance from the pivot. 1.8. Now the nice thing is the initial setup is kind of nasty, but almost always to get the variable by itself, all you're going to end up doing is dividing by a distance. How would I get FA by itself? Divide everything by 1.8. So let's see. Force A is going to be, what was the mass of the beam? It said, but I've scrolled down. 52 times 9.8 times 1.45 plus, what was the mass of the diver? 65 times 9.8 times 4.7 all divided by Do you get 2,073.8? So I'll go 2.07 times 10 to the third. There's force A. Now let's find force B. Since that's the only force I don't know, now I can say, you know what? Force up has to equal. By the way, if you had found force B first, Dorothy, by putting the pivot at A, the torque would all work. You could actually do this whole question using nothing but torque. So you could start over and put the pivot at A, adjust your distances, and that's perfectly valid. But you know what? Since I only got one unknown force, I can use translational equilibrium, which is quicker. Uh, F up. F A, no, F B only, right? F B is the only force up. That equals... Fa plus the mass of the beam times G plus the mass of the diver. Oh, this is nice because Fb is by itself already. It's going to be 2.07 times 10 to the third plus 52 times 9.8 plus 65 times 9.8. And again, I need more room, Mr. Duick. Classic. plus 52 times 9.8, plus 65 times 9.8. Do you get uh, 3,220? Or 3.22 times 10 to the third? That's torque. Key ideas, 
Don't forget center of mass, mass of the beam. Often they won't label that on you, but label your free body diagram. This is good free body diagram practice. Second key idea, put the pivot where you want it to be. Often getting rid of one torque and canceling out that force temporarily. Again, the reason we didn't need to take into account in torques what force B was doing was where we put our pivot, right there. How far is force B from the pivot? What's its distance? Zero. So how much torque will it exert if torque is four? Is zero. That, that's why in my torque equation, Dorothy, I could totally ignore the, the second unknown force and only focus on one. That's where torque's really nice. What can you try for homework from the big ultimate equilibrium review? I'll give you a couple to try. What I'll do is at the end of this unit, I'll collect this package for like 40 marks. Okay. Uh, you can do. Come on. Number one. Can't do number two yet because that's got angles. That's a beam. That's a torque question. Is that beam at an angle? Next lesson. That's a torque question. Is it at an angle? Next lesson. That's a torque question. Is the wire at an angle? Next lesson. You can do number nine. By the way, don't forget to include the mass of the rod on your diagram. There is a center of mass, and it's going to be, well, how long is this rod? 0.9, so where's the center of mass going to be? 0.45 from either end, but look where your pivot is. You have to do some arithmetic, okay? So I kind of like these questions. Uh. You can do 13. I'm going to skip. 21 is nasty, actually. It looks simple. It's one of the toughest questions all year. 25. A couple more. That's at an angle. Angle. 28. 29. Thirty. At an angle. Thirty-four. Okay. Your real homework, of course, is uh, study for the test Wednesday. You can work on this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Go. Cool.